All right, I think we'll get started. Uh, this is a session on shared decision making as patient-centered approach to the translation of comparative effectiveness research into practice. Um, I think we're going to do a little things a bit different than I think what's in the program. So we're going to start out with just providing a background on comparative effectiveness research, especially uh, mostly in the American context, uh, and uh, talk about a survey that we conducted about um, uh, primary care providers' uh, knowledge and preferences for comparative effectiveness research. Then really the key portion will be to have um, three really interesting trials that will be presented, and I think at least two, if not all three, are being presented for the first time. So it will be some uh, really interesting information from the um, three trials that I think have been recently, either ongoing or recently completed. Um, so to that end, um, the, the survey I'll talk about a little bit to just set the tone for the rest of the um, three uh, presentations. It's focused much more on what primary care providers think of shared decision making as a way to translate comparative effectiveness research into practice. Um, and specifically, this was um, funded by uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality uh, by a couple of the grants. And, um, and so, just to give you a background, there's a number of different definitions for comparative effectiveness research. And I think most of you have seen some version of it, but just, so this, just to set the stage, I'll sort of re-put um, it up, given that they, people have been seeing this for a few years now. Uh, but here, it's the generation and synthesis of evidence that compares the benefits and harms of alternative methods to prevent, diagnose, treat, and monitor a clinical condition or to improve the delivery of care. So that's broadly the focus on comparative effectiveness research. And a lot of the energy behind it, while it's been going on in the U.S. for at least 10 years, if not more, and probably the rest of the world, but oftentimes it's used for payer decisions. So it's deciding what's going to be paid for, what's not going to be paid for, but not much more on the provider side. And really the goal here was how do you um, create this evidence that can be used by providers and patients and all the stakeholders involved in decision making around treatments or um, uh, testing, et cetera. And so to this end, in 2009, um, uh, $1.1 billion was awarded to study comparative effectiveness research by the National, National Institutes of Health, um, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And just to set the tone of where this money is going, here you can see a bulk of this money, almost $750 plus million, is focused around evidence development and synthesis, and uh, infrastructure and methods development to generate this evidence. So what you can see is the third graph there is really the focus here is what's the amount that's being spent on translation and dissemination into practice. Very little relative to what's being used to generate the evidence. So you can generate a ton of evidence, but if it's not translating into practice, it's not going to have a great effect. Uh, this was a nice model uh, that Timby and uh, others have uh, created for translating CER into practice. And really, Thinking about once any results are generated for comparative effectiveness research, one, the first piece is interpretation. So how do people buy the results of that initial trial? Um, the formalizations is how, how do they get incorporated into guidelines? How do the key people sort of view those results incorporate into the tools that clinicians uh, typically use to make decisions? And then how do you disseminate those guidelines and how well do they get adopted into practice? Uh, and then this has feedback loops, as you can see, continuously throughout the process. And then ultimately, once that's there, how does it get implemented in the practice? And, and this is a great model, but as you can see, I'll, I'll present some examples on the slide of all the different areas where it's not worked. Um, and in very few cases does it actually work. So example, it's the all-hand trial that showed that thiazide diuretics were superior in preventing cardiovascular disease events, but the practice shows continued use of ACE inhibitors and translation of this evidence was no change in practice. Similarly, the Katie trial showed conventional antipsychotics were as effective as atypical antipsychotics. Again, no change in practice. Uh, similarly, the companion trial showed optimal medical therapy, um, both cardiac resynchronization therapy and CRT plus defibrillator use improved survival, but the continued use was medical therapy. So here, it was sort of anti-technology in, uh, in the change, and at least the evidence is very little change occurred. Same thing with the Courage trial, which focused on optimal medical therapy versus uh, angioplasty and continued use of angioplasty. Very little change, if at all. And the SPORT trial showed that um, surgery for lumbar uh, stenosis had better outcomes um, than non-surgical treatment results, according to cohort study results. Uh, the focus is um, 
primarily surgical treatment. Uh, it wasn't that better, but about the same, and there was no change in practice here. So as you can see, there's a number of issues here that lead to a lack of translation of this comparative evidence of different treatments into practice. Uh, and here's another example, and this is what I'll speak about because the survey here that I'll present the results was from this underlying tr uh, trial related to this. So for diabetes medications, in 2007 and uh, 2010, HRQ um, conducted a comparative effectiveness review uh, and found really all the agents for uh, diabetes work similarly well. And yet, just recently, this is 2009 data, uh, which showed that huge variation in use of the different diabetes agents in the VA system in the U.S. So thiazolidine dyons, one of the classes of drugs for diabetes, um, adjusted results of range and percentage of patients receiving it from 1.4 to 25.4 percent. So huge variation. So if you look at even the 5th and 25th percentile, it's almost a 7 plus fold difference in the use of this agent. So you can't imagine that's driven by patient preferences here, right? Uh, similarly, the long-acting insulin analogs, same issue, the adjusted results vary from 4 to 71.2 percent, and here you can see the 5th percent, 11.4 percent of patients received it, up to 64 percent of patients at the 95th percentile, again, a six-fold difference in the use of these agents. So, again, this is not driven by patient preferences or guideline-driven care. So why is it difficult to translate this evidence into practice? Um, and there's a few re reasons. We uh, completed a qualitative study uh, with Elaine Murado from University of Colorado leading it within the CTSA sites. Um, and Justin Timby did similarly with a variety of sites. And here's, so the key reasons being one, the misalignment of financial incentives, especially when you're thinking of technology versus medical therapy. Um, Given the reimbursement for technology, there's a preference towards technology. So as a result, it's difficult to get the technology out of the system once it's uh, been incorporated because of the financial incentives. The complexity of research, so what we heard consistently is, um, uh, and you'll see in this, um, uh, in, in our survey results as well, is that clinicians had difficulty sort of identifying what research to take and translate into practice and what the quality of that research was. Um, especially when it came to observational studies versus uh, randomized trials and the size of random, randomized trials. So the research really was not, uh, did not allow for clinicians to translate this evidence into practice. Uh, biases and in interpretation of results. So it's underlying it. Do you have a bias? So if you have a pro-technology uh, bias, for example, you are much more likely when it shows two, two different treatments to be even be biased towards that specific treatment. Um, applicability of the evidence, there's a, in, a, a, in the COURAGE trial, for example, one of the reasons the cardiologists said they couldn't take that evidence into practice was because it did not apply to their patients, that the patients that were included in the trial were much different than what are typically treated. So, so that's another uh, reason. And, and then ultimately, how do you get this into the routine workflow for the clinician? And that's where the use of decision support comes in. So the limited use of decision support is another reason that's been identified through uh, these two qualitative studies. So, so we know a lot less about the role of shared decision making and decision aids or decision support tools in translating this evidence into practice. Um, so here what I'm going to present is uh, we have this 22-site cluster randomized trial called TRICEP, translating information about comparative effectiveness into practice. Um, and sites are randomized to use of decision aids versus guideline-based care. The trial started in February 2011, and um, clinicians within each site had uh, whether they had to decide whether they wanted to participate or not. So not all clinicians at each site participated in this study. Um, and so what we did uh, was survey the clinicians, all the clinicians at all the sites, um, not just the ones who are participating uh, in the survey that I'll talk about here. So it's not the trial results as much as sort of a sub-study within the trial. And just to set the framework, um, these are decision aids to be used within the clinical encounter. So, so these tools were developed by bringing research evidence, patient values and preferences into the clinical encounter. So just so everyone's on the same page, these uh, tools that Glenn uh, presented earlier today, so these are the main decision aids for use in this trial. 
Um, so the specific aim here of the survey that we looked at was to assess the primary care provider perceptions about the role of shared decision making for translating CER into practice. So really that was the focus here. And it was a sub-study within this big trial. Uh, we went through an iterative process to develop the survey, so we used a variety of clinicians to sort of go through and look at the survey questions to see did that make sense and did it work from the length perspective. Did it make sense? The main constructs we focused on, one was knowledge about comparative effectiveness research. Uh, quality of the evidence clinicians felt was necessary for comparative effectiveness research to be translated. Uh, their uh, perceptions about mechanisms for translating CER, and then knowledge about shared decision making. What did the clinicians feel about shared decision making? I'll tell you um, examples as we were trying to get this trial out, out and rolling. When I visited the sites to try to get them to um, uh, enroll and so forth, one of the key things whenever we mentioned uh, shared decision making was, I already do it, right? So that, that's not an uncommon answer. Uh, but it's interesting here in this survey, the results uh, differ a little bit. It was a web-based survey sent to 271 primary care providers. Um, these providers practice in urban, rural, suburban settings, so it was across all different settings. And what I'll present is mostly descriptive analyses of this survey. Um, the response rate was 42.8%. Uh, we didn't have any incentives, so given no incentive, clinician surveys is a reasonably good response rate. As you can see, the participants in the trial responded at a higher rate than the, compared to non-responders. However, the gender breakdown was similar. I don't have age here, but age was, age was very similar between the two groups as well. Um, it was, I think the mean age was uh, around 47 in each of the groups. So in terms of evidence and practice, um, so one of the first questions we ask is, do you feel clinical evidence that is generated is applicable to your practice? Even though we hear after the trials you know, come into being that, oh, that evidence doesn't apply. In this case, where we asked more generically, 87% thought that strongly or moderately agreed that the evidence typically applied to their practice. And then the question was, what are the resources you use to get this evidence for your practice? And so the most common was distilled resources such as up-to-date. And the least common was industry representatives. So we asked a variety of different, eight different uh, questions of what do you use? Do you use other clinicians within your practice? Um, do you use CME programs? Do you use, you know, and so by far the distilled resources were the most common. It wasn't even close compared to the next one. And then um, least common, almost 90% said they don't use industry representatives to get evidence. So um, it's interesting. It's one of the biases that I'll talk about is the limitations of this survey. So knowledge about CR, what did these, did these clinicians feel they knew what comparative effectiveness research was? Um, did they feel, feel familiar, moderately familiar? And interestingly, only about 40% of the clinicians participating in this trial, or not participating, at the sites participating in this trial, um, either were very familiar or moderately familiar with comparative effectiveness research. And a huge proportion, almost 60%, um, and 20% of which were not at all familiar with the term comparative effectiveness research. And it's, it's interesting because we've spent so much effort and energy around comparative effectiveness research for the last um, three to four years, and yet, you know, these are practicing primary care providers. A fifth did not know what comparative effectiveness research was. So that's a challenge, going back to that first slide. If there's so much money being put into generating this evidence, if most clinicians are not aware of it, how do you get it into practice? Um, approximately half felt comfortable evaluating the evidence for translation into practice. So the flip side is half did not feel comfortable evaluating the uh, evidence for translating into practice. So that's another challenge here as we try to get this um, evidence into routine practice. Um, however, almost four-fifths were optimistic that comparative effectiveness research would improve the quality of healthcare in the U.S. So that's interesting, given what they felt about the knowledge about CER, and yet uh, four out of five thought that they were optimistic that it would improve the quality of healthcare in the country. Uh, knowledge about shared decision-making. So again, here it was interesting. We asked how familiar they were with shared decision-making. Uh, much more, about 65% or two-thirds thought they were either very familiar or moderately familiar with shared decision-making. So this is in contrast to comparative effectiveness research. You see much different results here. And about a third, not, uh, you know, not very familiar or not at all familiar. 
Um, however, when we asked the participants of the study compared to the non-participants, almost 80% of the participants were familiar with shared decision making compared to only about half in the non-participant group. So clearly participating in the trial had some effect on how um, individuals, even in the control arm, uh, viewed shared decision making. And mechanisms for translating CR. So we asked them, what do you think about these various mechanisms for translating CR into practice? So CME, shared, shared decision making, clinical decision support, payer coverage, and practice guidelines. So here you can see the three highest areas. Practice guidelines was by far, well, 98% thought it was a good way for translating CR into practice. Uh, and then clinical decision support and CME were right in the 90 plus percent. Shared decision making was about 85%, a little bit less than the other three but not as bad as peer coverage. So most people thought of peer coverage was a terrible way of translating evidence into practice. And what did they think about impact of shared decision making on patient outcomes? So here we asked them to rate, what did you think were the expected outcomes for shared decision making? By far, um, almost 99% thought satisfaction with care, that it would improve satisfaction with care was the main reason. But then, you know, medication adherence, patient engagement, and priority setting were relatively high up there uh, in terms of impact on intermediate outcomes. While it still was over 80 percent, that was the least likely. So this is hemoglobin A1C or other markers of disease. So really the focus, at least the primary care providers thought the main reason for shared decision making was to improve the satisfaction with care. It would um, help with priority setting, patient engagement, and medication adherence. Now, just to give you a sense, most of these patients, as I said, were part of this trial, but we also asked them, have you used any other tools for shared decision making? Uh, just to get a sense of how that affected, how patients viewed the role of shared decision making. About 40% um, uh, had had experience with other tools besides the diabetes cards that I presented earlier. The most common second tool was the one Annie will talk about, because a lot of same sites were also doing the depression trials. It was the depression cards that Annie will talk about. Uh, but others had used a variety of tools, such as um, for knee replacement, uh, for uh, palliative care. So there were a variety of other tools that people had used, but by far the... Um, so it really helped uh, setting their experience for this. Now, the main limitation of the results here is these were Midwestern primary care practices participating in a trial. So the main reason we focused on sites participating in a trial is so that the, the clinicians at some point were exposed to the idea of shared decision making and comparative effectiveness research, even though the survey shows otherwise, as opposed to just uh, having naive clinicians imagining what shared decision making was. So that was one of the main reasons we focused on this subgroup of clinicians here. Um, there's a response bias and specifically social acceptability bias. So for example, what you see is completely anti-drug industry sort of uh, re uh, responses and that may be true, but it could also be a social acceptability bias where a clinician thought that was the answer that they should uh, respond to here. So just to summar summarize and conclude here, the awareness of CER is relatively low. However, awareness of uh, shared decision making is relatively high. About two thirds of the clinicians were familiar with it. Uh, commonly used distilled resources for evidence, um, low comfort uh, typically for primary care providers for evaluating the quality of evidence. Um, most agree that shared decision making may be a mechanism for translating CER and perceive that shared decision making is associated with greater satisfaction. So going back to this uh, idea from this morning, at least this suggests there's good hope for translating CER or, or translating shared decision making into practice, implementing into routine practices um, uh, based on the responses of clinicians at least who get exposed to uh, shared decision making at some level. So with that, I will um, move it on to Hazel, who will talk about uh, her experience in the context of asthma care. We'll have maybe, if there's any, if there are a couple of questions, I can take that. But otherwise, what we'll do is have about two or three minutes for questions after each presentation, and then at the end, we'll have probably about 15 to 20 minutes for um, questions more broadly.
Yeah, they were all mutually exclusive, so they had to rate from um, highly likely to low likelihood of being successful in translating CR into practice. So, um, so they weren't uh, mutually exclusive, so they could have all of those. They could rate as highly likely, for example, for translating CR into practice. Right. Whereas um, SDM really, well, SDM being more of a clinical encounter mode and CME being more of a technology or resources. So being confronted with the questions like, how am I going to translate? Well, of course, SDM is good because SDM is a good approach to clinical practice. CME, yeah, that would be good as well. Practice guidelines would be good as well. Are those equivalent? Things yes. Or mechanism. No, I think that's a good point. It, um, part of the reason we included each of them separately is we asked initially, um, it was a question where we asked people to rate each of them and order them. Um, and then we went through iterative process with clinicians and they, they preferred, so this was based on some of the clinician feedback we did the pilot surveys, that it's better, that maybe it's multiple mechanisms for translation. They wanted that to show up and that was the main reason. Uh, knowing full well, we initially didn't even have CME on that list, but that was one of the um, main reasons based on the feedback, um, because we really want that, wanted them to do a rank order exercise, because we thought that would be more interesting, but um, we, got, we had four different clinicians who really sort of argued for it, and so it was one of those things where, uh, since we were asking their feedback, so we had to sort of read them. Small way. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right. I think that's, so we asked them what they thought of other, how often they consulted other primary care clinicians, other specialists, and those were rated fairly high as well, but they still rated guidelines as the highest, but um, that was the challenge. So we kept the survey generic. We didn't have it to a specific condition. So in some ways that would have been uh, better, but we just wanted to get a broader sense of what primary clinicians thought. and so. They may consult guidelines or be aware of guidelines for certain things, but not for everything. For other things, they may refer to other clinicians. And so we couldn't really distinguish it, it here. I think it was more a gestalt of what they thought how they practice there. Yeah, that's an yeah, important point as well. Thanks. So as previously introduced, my name is Hazel Tapp. I serve as Associate Director for Research in the Department of Family Medicine, Carolina's Healthcare System in Charlotte, North Carolina, USA. Um, joining me is Tamara Alparazi, who's the project coordinator for our project. And today I'm describing our work to implement shared decision making to improve outcomes for patients with asthma within Carolina's healthcare system. And uh, this is our team. So I'll be discussing the background to our project, our implementation process, our actual intervention, and outcome results. So we know that chronic diseases such as asthma have disparities in health outcomes. There's poor adherence to the care plan and high healthcare costs. Failure to consider patient circumstances and goals may contribute to this poor adherence. Shared decision-making is patient-centered care that enables and encourages patients to participate in the management of their own health. So prior to the 80s, the common approach to decision-making was paternalistic, with physicians assuming the dominant role. It was considered that for most illnesses, a single best treatment existed, and physicians would know what it was and consistently apply this information to their own patients. So during the 80s, this began to be questioned. There was an informed model developed where information exchange is one way from physician to patient. The physician is assumed to be the primary source of information. 
um, to the patient on medical issues and the patient's disease and treatment options. The remaining tasks of deliberation and decision making were kind of left open, left up to the patient. So in shared decision making, there's a two-way information exchange. The physician should inform the patient of all available treatment options, benefits and risks, and potential effects on the patient's psychological and social well-being. The patient needs to provide information on values, preferences, lifestyle, belief, knowledge about illness, and treatment. So the essential point for shared decision-making interaction and what we explain to the patient is we understand the idea of shared decision-making is a little overwhelming. We quickly explain we don't expect them to know about the clinical knowledge part. What we say to the patient is you're the 100% expert on what is important to you. This is maybe in terms of preferences, what works for you, what past experiences you've had, what's worked for you and what didn't your beliefs, remembering to take the medicines, are you okay with taking meds morning and night, would you prefer to just take them in the morning, is that what really happens? Uh, so the shared part for you is this expertise that you bring to the table. So the provider will bring clinical knowledge to the table, expertise such as benefits and risks and potential effects. So how did we implement? So our setting is Carolina's healthcare system, which is located in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's one of the largest public not-for-profit systems in the US. We operate more than three dozen hospitals and more than 900 care locations, including physician practices. There are over 60,000 patients with asthma in the system. The shared decision-making intervention has been implemented at six ambulatory clinics within the system. A further 84 practices serve as controls where asthma patient information is retrieved from the electronic medical record for our analysis. The ambulatory clinics within the network serve the majority of the community's vulnerable patients. There are approximately 92,000 patients and about 220,000 annual visits. The patient population is mostly uninsured, sliding scale, or patients with Medicaid Medicare. Within the six sites, there are three family medicine practices, one predominantly African-American, one predominantly Hispanic children, one about 60% African-American, 40% Caucasian, as a residency training practice, two are PEDS practices, one with a large Hispanic population, one is teenager specialty practice, and one internal medicine practice with mixed patient population. So this map shows Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, which is the home of Charlotte, North Carolina. The city center is marked with a star towards the center of the map. The inset picture on the lower right shows where we are in relation to North Carolina. The red lines are major road arteries, and we mapped out locations of our clinic sites in and around the center of Charlotte with a black cross. Next, we mapped out asthma patient density by census tract. This is a map of where people with asthma live who also go to one of the six sites. Most of our patients live in a horseshoe area around the center of Charlotte. So we also mapped out where patients with asthma live who have asthma inpatient visits to the hospital. The areas where the patients live are also close to our outpatient clinic sites. We are located in areas where we can best serve our vulnerable patients and try to help them stay out of the hospital by receiving continuity care in a primary care clinic. So our approach to implementation involved a participatory approach based on principles of community-based participatory research. We engaged, uh, we engaged the clinics as partners. We initially approached clinicians we knew at each site and engage them as champion physicians and started meeting regularly with them. Uh, when we first talk with physicians and clinic staff about shared decision making, it doesn't take long before we hear about the barriers the staff have to implementation. The number one barrier we hear about is lack of time, where they perceive they don't have time to devote to shared decision making. Staff and providers feel that while it sounds like a good idea, they're not sure if it would work for their patient population. They have staffing concerns. They're not sure about availability of current staff to perform the role of health coach. 
There are worries about productivity. They're concerned about the potential for high no-show rates if they develop a specialized clinic around shared decision making. They have logistical concerns, how to manage an extended visit, such as that required for working through a shared decision making toolkit. They're concerned about space for the intervention and they're concerned about sustainability. How will they fund the intervention when research support ends? So we worked in cooperation with these representatives from all six sites. We were meeting at least monthly and we ultimately planned a three month rollout of implementation into practices. During week one to eight, we decided that a practice facilitator would go weekly into the practices. They introduced our participatory approach, the shared decision making toolkit, scheduling logistics, patient recruitment, and staff underwent toolkit training. Then the first clin clinic was held about week eight. Then the facilitator returned to troubleshoot how things went and what new issues arose that needed to be addressed. The rollout took place in a consecutive, overlapping three-month schedule. We revisited each clinic site after 12 months in order to do a refresher visit where we shared project outcome results and addressed issues. During these visits, the practice facilitator offered templates of how patient, patient scheduling might work. For example, this is a template for a half-day clinic with six consecutive patients. Each patient spends time with a nurse, health coach, PCP, and takes a survey for the research team. Another template shows how a schedule with physician work-ins might work. So in the third column, work-ins are labeled A, a B, C, etc. The physician can see twice as many patients. This is because the health coach visit takes twice as long as, it's, as the physician visit. Another template shows how one clinic wanted to just see asthma patients during the end of a session with continuity patients at the front end. So here is our intervention. Uh, the intervention was based on the work done by Sandra Wilson in Kaiser Permanente. She did a randomized control trial in the early 2000s. Uh, we kind of adapted her intervention. So this slide serves as an overview. Uh, first, the health coach will set the stage. The health coach could be a nurse, educator, farm D, mid-level, anybody who's got an interest in shared decision making and asthma. Uh, they'll set the stage by establishing rapport with the patient. Then the health coach will gather patient information on symptoms, goals, and preferences. They provide information, assess understanding, review disease knowledge, and confirm comprehension. The health coach negotiates a plan in the light of patient's goals and preferences and deliberates each option with the patient. The health coach and physician huddle to discuss the treatment plan and finally the physician will go in, talk to the patient, maybe write a prescription and do some teach back. In order to gather patient information, we have a very detailed patient information form which gets the patient communicating with us very quickly. Here's just an overview of what the patient information form looks like. We ask in-depth questions about medication history, hospitalizations, triggers, exacerbations. Very early on in this session, working with the information form, we ask the patient to use a hands-on dial to tell us how well controlled they feel. The patient can move the arrow and point to how they're feeling. They usually think they're doing pretty well and point the arrow to the yellow or green areas. So we adapted the form to use with children, some smiley face for dials, and we translated dials for non-English speaking patients. So we ask about goals for asthma treatment. For example, playing, playing sports again may be a goal, or simply feeling better in certain seasons is often a goal. We ask the patient to prioritize their preferences. We suggest for, um, preferences, control of the disease, side effects, cost, and convenience of delivery of the medications. We ask the patient to rank them one to four. They have the option of other preferences where the patient can suggest their own preference. So in order to educate about the disease, we ask the patient to describe how they consider asthma. We then help them describe it by showing them this picture. We briefly educate the patient using the picture, emphasizing how bronchial tubes look with or without control, showing the three main problems of uncontrolled asthma, swelling mucus and tight muscles. 
On the back of the form, we talk about the difference between rescue and controller. We explain rescue only addresses one of the issues, the tight muscles. So it will relax the muscles, but doesn't address the swelling and the mucus. This is why they need another medication called the controller. The controller takes longer to have effect, but in the long run, provides better control over the disease. We also show pictures of common medications, circle the meds the patient uses. We also practice inhaler and peak flow use at this time. So at this point, we have a list of what's important to the patient. We know the goals and preferences, current symptoms, ED and hospitalizations, spirometry results, current medications taken, and triggers. So we next use a second dial to show the patient where they actually fall in terms of severity. We explain to them that in the light of their symptoms, for example, they're having daily symptoms, they're using their rescue a lot, they're waking up at night, they've been to the ED or hospital, they're actually not doing as well as they thought. This is often an aha moment for the patient. They got used to feeling the way they feel and they don't realize they could be doing better. So at this point, we can negotiate a treatment plan. We show the patient a laminated sheet of their medication options matched to their insurance options. We don't expect the patient to understand what all this means. We just want them to be aware that there are choices. The options card is color coded to match the dial of severity. Here are the options for an adult Medicaid patient at step three of the guidelines. We use a medication planner form to work through the negotiation. First, we list the preferences the patient has previously stopped, told us as features that matter to me in rank order down the left column of the form. Then we ask the patient what they're currently taking, not what they're prescribed. We usually start with albuterol. We suggest a way to code the preferences for each medication in terms of what's important to the patient. For example, albuterol doesn't give much control, so we put a plus with brackets around it. It's one copay, so it gets a single dollar sign. There are slight side effects, and you have to carry it around and use it multiple times during the day, so it's not very convenient. So it might get a one plus for that. We go back to the medication options form to get a medication option for the patient. For example, the patient might choose Advair. Similarly to Albuterol, we go through the choice in the light of the chosen preferences. Advair gives better control, three pluses. It's more expensive, but has fewer side effects. It's more convenient, you don't have to carry it around. So we'll go back and select additional medications. We go back and forth in this way until the form has several preferences and deliberations are done in this way with each new medicine. Eventually, a medication is selected. Here, for example, Advair was chosen. The patient may say they chose it because it's the most convenient, it's one puff twice a day, there's only one medication, which means only one to keep up with, one copay, etc. So how do our results look? So here we show the change in asthma emergency department visits for individual patients who have gone through shared decision making and used the toolkit against control patients. So we've called this the SDM toolkit group. We have two controls. One control is patients who attended the clinics where shared decision-making had been implemented, but they didn't receive the toolkit. They're called the SDM exposed group. The second control is patients attending asthma visits throughout the 84 other primary care sites. This is the other site's control. We found that asthma ED visits dropped 36% in the six months following the toolkit visit compared to the prior six months. This compares with only 17% for the SDM exposed control and 11% for the other sites combined control. So then we looked at the change in asthma hospitalizations. Here we show the change in asthma hospitalization for individual patients going through shared decision making. Hospitalizations dropped 58% in the six month following the toolkit visit compared to the six months before. Compared with 50% for the SDM exposed control, 30% for the other sites combined control. Here we show the change in oral steroid orders, such as pregnisone, which is a marker of acute exacerbation. Oral steroid use dropped 45% in the three months following the toolkit visit compared to the three months before. 
This compares with 30% for the SDM exposed control and 24% for the other sites combined control. We also looked at oral steroid use in the six months following the toolkit visit compared with the six months before. This compares with only 15% for the, ex so it was 27% decrease, compared with 15% for the exposed control and 10% for the other sites combined control. So then we asked the patient who made the treatment decision today. Was it you alone, or the provider alone, or a mixture of you and the provider? For example, mostly you, partly provider, mostly the provider, and partly you. Or equally you and the provider shared in the decision. So 87% of patients felt that they had equally or partially shared in the decision. So in conclusion, nearing the end of year three of the project, all six practices have remained fully engaged with a plan for sustainability, and all sites are represented at our monthly shared decision-making meetings still. Thank you. So our next speaker is um, Jennifer Burke from uh, UCSF, and uh, she will be talking about um, shared decision making for osteoarthritis. Which one is yours? Oh, right, sir. So, gracias por la oportunidad de estar aquí hoy y poder compartir mis investigaciones con ustedes. So I had to say one sentence at least in Spanish while I'm in Lima. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and to the organizers, to Annie, to Victor, and everyone who's worked so hard to pull this conference together. It's really an honor to be here and to present some of the work I've done with my colleagues um, at UCSF and with the help of Victor as a consultant on this project. And you can see I hail from San Francisco. So I'm going to present work about uh, a low literacy decision aid tool that we developed for vulnerable populations with rheumatoid arthritis. I'm going to give a little bit of background about rheumatoid arthritis. I'll describe the process of how we develop these tools and then really share with you some results from our pilot trial. So rheumatoid arthritis is the most common inflammatory arthritis. It affects about 1% of the North American population. It carries with it significant morbidity, increased mortality, and significant cost, not just to the individual and the family, but also to society. So there's a recent um, number that came out that it costs more to treat rheumatoid arthritis than it does to treat diabetes in the United States. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is the case in terms of the medications. So in addition to being a very burdensome disease, very costly disease, there are very complex treatment choices for patients. Um, we generally start people on monotherapy with methotrexate, which is the most commonly used synthetic disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. But after patients fail that, there is a wide open field of medications and combinations of medications and a lack of head-to-head -head trials. Although there was a recent one last week in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed non-inferiority in a combination of synthetic DMARDs and a combination of methotrexate with a biologic or a tenorcept. So again, there's plenty of room for conversation and shared decision making in rheumatoid arthritis. So despite significant progress in how we treat this disease, the drugs we have to treat it, um, there continue to be significant variations in processes of care and outcomes for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So in a study of almost 500 patients, adults with rheumatoid arthritis, in two, co two clinics in San Francisco, we found that uh, non-white racial ethnic minorities, non-English speakers, and immigrants had significantly higher disease activity and poor function compared to their counterparts. And there have been other studies to show disparities in outcomes. Um, there have also been studies that show there's variation in, in the appropriate treatment. So patients uh, with rheumatoid arthritis, there's a quality indicator that says everyone with rheumatoid arthritis should receive a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. 
There was a large study of over 90,000 adults in the, in the U.S., 65 and over, who had pharmacy coverage, and 63% of them were receiving a DMARD. Um, so, and there was also significant variation by race, ethnicity, older age, and geographic variation as well. So um, there is suboptimal care for these patients and, and outcomes. And in a study we recently completed at UCSF and over, again, 500 patients, um, we did a self-reported measure of patient-physician communication, and within that, looked specifically at communication around shared decision-making and found that 30% of this 500 patients reported suboptimal shared decision-making communication with their clinicians. And the factors that were associated with that were Latino ethnicity, patients with limited Ang English language proficiency, limited health literacy, low education, and lower trust. So none of this is a surprise, but again, it's, it's work that hasn't necessarily been done in diverse populations with rheumatoid arthritis. So we have a very, um, you know, we have a common inflammatory arthritis has significant impact on the patients, on society. We have made progress in terms of how we treat this disease and treating it to target, um, but yet there are still significant disparities. So we felt that we were in the perfect position to try to tackle this problem and develop some tools to help at least improve uh, communication with these patients and, and develop uh, uh, a tool, uh, uh, a low literacy tool for patients uh, with rheumatoid arthritis. So this is um, a project that was funded through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, one of the IADAP grants, to develop um, and to adapt a summary guide that had already been produced by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality that um, tried to summarize their comparative effectiveness research around rheumatoid arthritis medications, um, and they were, there was a call to try to make this guide more accessible to a broader population of patients. So we took on the task of adapting their guide and, and in addition, developing a decisioning tool. So we did this project in three phases. The first phase was really a needs assessment to try to get at what are these patients, what are their concerns before they start a medication, who do they trust? Where do they get their information? How do they communicate with their physicians? We did this project in three languages, so English, Spanish, and Chinese. And you can see here is one of the um, just large post-its from the Chinese focus group. Um, and we also did a focus group with clinicians as well. And there was a literature review done by ARC, but we also supplemented that as well. So we took that information. We took patients from the focus groups and created a patient advisory board. Um, so we had bilingual English-Spanish, English-Chinese, as well as English patients on this, the patient advisory board. We met monthly throughout the second year of the project to develop the tools, and we also involved multiple stakeholders, a health literacy expert, designer, a decision aid expert, Victor Montori, and did multiple iterations of the guide and the decision aid tool in parallel so that the, the design was consistent across the materials which we learned was very important from our designer. So that was very instructive to me to go through that process. Um, and you can see this is just a picture of two of our patients with rheumatoid arthritis and the patient advisory board. And it was also, it was always a very rich uh, time together. So we, we went through multiple iterations. We did cognitive interviews with the final tools. And then the final step was to do a pilot trial. And that's what I'm gonna describe for you now. So this is just two of the five issue cards, and I apologize, it's hard to see some of the small type, but I'm gonna walk you through. Um, these are issue cards, again, they're based on the diabetes issue cards that were developed at the Mayo Clinic and you've seen and been referred to earlier today. So our cards present 12 different disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. We elected to divide them up into the mode of administration, so the top row are oral pills, the second row are injectables or shots, and the third row is an infusion. And again, I want to emphasize these, was, these cards were developed for a low literacy population, so there are very few words, more icons, and more white space um, is what were the goal. And so on the top left corner, on, on how often the drug is taken is methotrexate, which I referred to earlier. So that's taken once a week. There's a little calendar that says once a week. And then the, the pills go across and just tells you how often it's taken. The pills can be taken at home, so there's an icon of a home there. The shots can be given at home or at the clinic, and so you can see the clinic uh, icon there next to the home. And then the infusions are given in the clinic or in the hospital. Um, so that just sort of orients the patient 
And then the how soon, again, the medications are all aligned across the cards that can be set up against one another. So we have the how often card, the how soon it will work. There's variation in how in the onset of action of these drugs. It can take up to 12 weeks for some of them. Cost was another issue, side effects, and then special considerations. So there are certain drugs that cannot be taken in pregnancy. Tuberculosis is, is a big issue, especially for um, uh, immigrant populations and the populations we were dealing with, and liver disease, et cetera. Um, and again, these are all in three languages, and I've brought copies of them with me today. Um, so if people are interested, I can show you. Um, and I, I know time is short, so I'm not going to necessarily go into how they're used in the clinic, but um, the, the physicians were able to start with just three cards. Ms. Jones, your rheumatoid arthritis is very active today. We need to discuss a medication change or an addition. What would you like to talk about first? And so they were presented with the issues and able to pick. And I'll show you a real life encounter that, that explicitly shows this. So the trial, patients had to be a member of a vulnerable population, so the eligibility is listed there. Um, we needed there to be a situation where a medication discussion would take place, so patients had to have moderate to high severe, uh, moderate to severe, uh, moderate to high disease severity at the clinic visit. So we used a rapid uh, self-reported measure of disease activity in the clinic. Uh, it's called a rapid three. It's scored very quickly by the research assistants. If they had moderate to high disease activity on this measure, they were consented and then enrolled into the trial right then and there in the clinics. We enrolled patients from one of two clinics, the county hospital and then the university hospital rheumatoid arthritis clinic. And our primary outcomes of interest were the rheumatoid arthritis knowledge. Um, and we developed uh, eight questions and actually the range is from zero to 10. I apologize for that typo. And then we used the low literacy version of the decisional conflict scale. And so we had three arms to the trial, and I'm just going to describe briefly uh, how this was laid. On, on, on the left side, this is the original summary guide developed by AHRQ. So patients in the first arm were given this guide in the waiting room after they were enrolled and allowed to, to leaf through it. They went into their clinic, clinic visit and had a usual care visit, and then were administered the decisional conflict scale and the RA knowledge scale after. In arm two, they were given the, up, the adapted summary guide that we developed in their preferred language, went into their clinic visit per usual, and again, were uh, given the questionnaires post-clinic. Post and then in the third arm of the trial, the patients were given the adapted summary guide, and then the decision aid tool was used in the visit itself. And so I'm gonna just give you, these are the results, these are the patient characteristics by study arm. You can see this is a pilot trial, so it doesn't emphasize this is not a large, huge trial, but these are um, um, approximately 60 patients per arm, but there is some variability. Um, patients were fairly similar across the three arms in terms of their age, the language that they spoke. Um, more than two-thirds were immigrants, and uh, half or more had less than high school education, and we had a fair number of people with limited health literacy. There was some differences by gender, so there were more women in the first and third arm than in the second. And then we did have fewer people with limited health literacy in the third arm. And in terms of the primary outcomes of interest, these are adjusted for gender, clinic, and language. In terms of their RA knowledge score, and again, I apologize, the range is 0 to 10 here, um, we saw a slight increase in knowledge through the, the second and third arm, but this was not statistically significant. And in terms of decisional conflict, so the lower your score, the less conflict, we did see um, a decrease in decisional conflict across uh, the, the three arms, and again, this is arm two compared to arm one, arm three compared to arm one, and it was approaching statistical significance. So I think these, these were encouraging results to us, and again, the sample size is, is, is somewhat small. But I'm gonna show you two images, which I think for me speak volumes, and we did videotape and audio tape our encounters in the, in the trial, and we will be um, reviewing those Formally, we haven't done that yet, but this is an encounter, and I have permission from both of these people to, to show you this to you today, which I watched in its entirety. And the physician during this encounter was keyboarding. He was looking at the computer. He was responding to some questions from the patient, but the whole encounter was really him focusing on the computer. She very nicely is engaged with our adapted guide, which is nice to see, but the amount of communication during the visit was, was somewhat limited. So um, this was another encounter um, with the same physician, and uh, 
a patient, I, this is a brief video I'm gonna show you, but he did a little bit of keyboarding, talked to her, did an exam, and then he put his hands on, his de on the desk and he pushed his chair away, he grabbed the decision aid tool and turned to her, and then this is what, um, I can get this to work, sorry. Technology, not my strength. So we have these cards, and these cards are designed to help make decisions about what medications to treat you with. So I've been starting with three cards. We're not going to focus as much on cost and additional considerations like pregnancy for the time being. No, I don't want to get pregnant. Okay. So yeah, so we'll skip. We'll yeah, we'll So then we have side effects. How often? How soon does it take effect? Would you like to talk about one of these two things? Yeah. Uh, well, if it, as I have hepatitis B, I think we should talk about the side effects. Good, okay. So there you can see a very different scene where the doctor was pulled away from the computer and they went on to have a very rich conversation about her options. She has a chronic disease, which makes certain things somewhat dangerous for her. And you know, they went on to have a very lengthy and engaged discussion around her options, which was, it was a very rich, Discussion. So this, to me, is, is, was very satisfying to see the difference in the communication. So I, I think in conclusion, we can say there is suboptimal shared decision-making communication in rheumatoid arthritis. So there's certainly disparities. But I think what we learned through this process is that it is feasible in these populations from the very beginning to involve them in the development of the tools through to testing them, and, and that this is feasible in these populations. Um, so that was a learning experience in and of itself. It was not an easy thing for us to do, but it was a very rewarding experience, and to see the patients become more and more engaged throughout was um, very satisfying. I think these low literacy tools have the potential to improve knowledge and certainly to reduce decisional conflict, and with the videos and audio tapes, we'll certainly see how the communication may vary with and without the tools. And I don't have to convince anyone in this room that enhanced patient involvement has the potential to improve outcomes, and I think we continue on that path. Um, so I just I want to acknowledge the principal investigator on this project, which is Ed Yellen at IHPS at UCSF, Dean Schillinger, who's a health communications expert and was a consultant, as well as Victor, um, and, and several other people who are really key in, in, in this project and our funders. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and our last presentation um, is by Annie LeBlanc. She's going to present about the experience with um, uh, shared decision making for depression medications. Thank you, everyone. And before I get started, I just want to say if you have the opportunity um, to look at the Chinese versions of those cards, they are just Phenomenal. We are just craving about those cards. So they're beautiful to look at. It's very, very fun to see. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm really excited to uh, get the opportunity to share with you um, our uh, latest trial that just got completed uh, a few months ago, uh, which was looking at the translation into practice of comparative effectiveness of depression medication um, into practice. And again, I just want to acknowledge that we have um, no financial and disclosure or no conflict to declare uh, either myself or my uh, colleagues. This was part um, similar to, um, to Jen. This was, this was part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act um, as one of their uh, IADAP grant to translate some of their uh, material into practice. And um, during clinical research and during clinical trials, uh, is just um, an, um, a tremendous amount of work, and this couldn't happen uh, without the teams that we have and the colleagues that we have. So I do want to acknowledge uh, the teams that, that work uh, on this. And as I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at Maggie here, um, I'm seeing that I've acknowledged one of our designers, but not Maggie that, pro uh, that provided us with uh, a lot of, of feedback as well throughout. So I'm, I'm sorry, Maggie. And I also want to acknowledge some of our colleagues from um, 
Hennepin uh, County Medical Centers that are uh, here as well and that are uh, contributed to, uh, to this trial. So they haven't seen any of the results yet, so I'm very excited to, to show it to them as well. So, uh, as you know, there's about 16 million Americans with, with depressions, and we know how it can affect their quality of life, their duration of life, and the burden um, that this disease causes to, uh, to them, to their family, and to the society. But we know that depression can be improved by lifestyle changes, self-care practices, psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy. But we know there are different efficacy, safety, cost, and burden to the patients and to the family. And we also know that um, that might be quite challenges when you think in terms of pharma pharmacotherapy specifically to try to navigate throughout the amount of, of, of information and choices that we have for these uh, particular conditions. Uh, from a clinician perspective in trying to get you know, our head um, around all those uh, different mitigations and side effects, but also from a patient perspective with everything that we see on TV and that we heard from friends and colleagues and um, the, the pharmaceutical companies are of, of a really strong uh, market and do a lot of, of um, lobbying for this particular condition. So it's very difficult when you have patients coming in, in the encounter to address these issues. So when we think in terms of pharmacotherapy, um, we know that there's a very high uh, non-response rate uh, for those medicines. So actually, um, there's 40% of patients won't respond to medicine, but they will eventually. So they, they will find one, but they might have to try a substantial amount of, of medicine to do so, uh, which causes high non-adherence uh, rate. And as Neely mentioned, we have the opportunity with comparative effectiveness to translate the information that we know into patient-centered uh, material. And one of the ways to do so is by using decision aid. Uh, we can be uh, of great help in using shared decision-making as um, both Hazel and Jen have uh, showed you previously. So for us, the objective of this study was to um, determine the ability of a decision aid to effectively translate depression, mitigation, comparative effectiveness into practice. And we, um, we focus on mitigation only for um, this first part of our study and this first part of the trial. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to move to all kind of, of therapy for depression, not only medicine, but that was kind of an initial thought to start with this. And we had two objectives, the first one which was to develop the decision aid and then to test it into primary care practices in real life encounters. So looking at the development of our tool, what we did is um, using our model, we adapted um, the uh, AHRQ, Comparative Effectiveness uh, Research document that they had on depression medicine. And um, we had to, I was going to say we had to cheat a little bit, but we wanted to make sure that we had the best evidence available. So we did include uh, a couple of more um, systematic reviews that included other patient important outcomes that weren't covered with that uh, particular uh, review. And one of the key things that we've mentioned prior to this is that in order for a tool to, any tool to be used, it needs to be approved by the key, uh, the key stakeholders that are going to be using it. So um, what we did is that we brought the summary of the evidence that we uh, did to a meeting uh, where we had 24 different people from 12 organizations. So patients, clinicians, payers, health plans, um, uh, health system administration, and I'm pretty sure forgetting people, but the whole spectrum of stake, we, uh, the whole spectrum of, of stakeholders. And we got them to look at that evidence and tell us, is there anything missing? Is that representative of how you feel, what you see in practice? So that um, we could be uh, confident into designing our tools. Uh, at the same time, we did a lot of clinical encounters observations with our amazing team of, of designers and study coordinators that helped us with that. Looking at what was happening in the encounters, uh, what we were seeing that seemed to work, but what was missing as well, to see how this tool that we were going to design would best meet their need. 
And we work with a team of, as I said, designer um, investigators. We have cl uh, clinical champion, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, uh, primary care doctor, uh, care, um, care managers. We had health literacy experts. We had sure decision making experts. Um, and we had uh, patients that had suffered depression uh, prior to, that were part of this whole process. And after um, a few fil uh, field testing, uh, we finally uh, brought this final products to the same team to see, you saw the evidence, here's the final products, what do you think, do you think that that's gonna make a difference? And um, this is what uh, we, uh, we came, came up with. So the, the depression cards um, and the depression decision, it works similarly to the diabetes cards for those who've seen them before. So they're grouped in terms of issues that matter the most to those patients. So while thinking about your next depression medicine, what do you need to, um, what do you need to know that will help you make this decision? And the main concerns were um, sexual issues, sleep, weight change, um, their st stopping approach, what happened if I stop taking my medicine, will I get sick, cost. And then interestingly enough, in addition to what mattered the most, um, patient wanted to know more about what to expect. So we came up with um, a what you should know card that will tell them a little bit about you know, how long they should wait until it works and the possible uh, side effects that everyone will experience. But it was interesting in the context of this trial was that clinician wanted something as well. So because they've struggled with, with medicine and they've struggled with a lot of the, um, the con 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 interactions. So we actually came up with a card for a clinician to help them identify which med medicine could be, uh, have potential interaction for their patients. So again, um, a set of cards that you will uh, work with your patient in asking, you know, well, what matters the most to you? And then helping patients navigate through that. And, and Jen showed example of those, so I'm not going to, but just to give you maybe a bigger look at some of the, some of the card and some of the issues. So if you're thinking about weight change or stopping appro the stopping approach and um, what patients actually um, very enjoyed was the sick if you skip. So what happened if I don't take this, this medicine? So then uh, we uh, provided those clinicians with a little guide. So this is our training for our clinician. We provide them with uh, one short uh, sheet with a summary of how they could approach their patients in terms of you know, what issue matters the most to you and working throughout the cards. We also have a little online demo, and I'm not gonna show it for um, making sure that we're on time, but they have a little demo on how to use it. And that information we provide at the beginning of the trials and then our study coordinators at the different site may do one-on-one -on -one interactions with clinicians if they have um, further questions or if they need clarification on how to use those cards. So to test the impact of um, the, the trial, we did a practice-based uh, randomized controlled trials in 10 rural and um, urban primary care practice throughout Minnesota and Wisconsin. And um, we had the goal of enrolling 300 patients with major depression, which is a PHK-9 uh, above 10. And we looked at the efficacy of the decision compared to usual care, and looking at specifically at clinicians and patient important outcome. So our main primary outcome was decisional conflicts for patients, and then um, knowledge uh, satisfaction from both patients and clinicians, uh, medication change, patient uh, engagements in the decision-making process, which we refer to as the options uh, score, uh, fidelity to decision and intended use from clinicians. And then we were also interested in looking at adherence and mood symptoms as reported by PHQ-9. Unfortunately, um, we're not done collecting um, the 12 months data for, for this, so uh, we're only presenting today the post-encounter outcomes. Um, in terms of analysis, we accounted for um, unbalanced characteristic, the nesting of clinicians and patients uh, under similar uh, practices and uh, regular basic um, analysis. So our result, um, all of our 10 sites, the first 10 sites that we approached uh, were, were uh, agreed to participate and um, non-withdrew 
and we uh, enroll 301 patients uh, across both arms. Um, we, um, to, we were very anxious at the beginning as to how, um, how we were going to be able to engage those patients into participating in a trial, uh, considering their condition and considering the patient, the, even the clinicians, uh, we thought they might be a little bit reluctant to engage their, their patient. But um, the, uh, we had very, very few decline uh, from patients or from clinicians who participate in the trial. And as I said, we, um, our uh, long-term data are not available currently, but we can uh, certainly look at the post-encounter outcomes. Um, so we were able to analyze 158 uh, encounters and 139 in our um, usual care arms. Uh, the majority of our patients were women, and um, they were actually fairly young. So um, the majority of our trial, our average is 62 years old. So um, in this one, we have a much younger population, uh, very few smokers, uh, PHQ-9, an average of, of 15, which come from major depression. And um, we also wanted to make sure that our decision were uh, appropriate for uh, health, uh, for every spectrum of health literacy and numeracy. Um, so we want to make sure that that was included as well. Um, the length of the visit varied greatly um, according to, to the setting or, or where we, are, we were, but um, mainly on average were between 15 and 15 minutes and, and half an hour, um, and there were no difference across uh, usual care or the decision aid arm. So looking at our main outcome, which was decisional conflicts, um, we show that the use of these tools and what you're seeing here, I cheated a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, you're seeing the scale from a zero to 50, which should be out of a zero out of 100. Um, but, but because um, our uh, decisional conflict score was so low, I truncated it, so please uh, keep this in mind. Um, and then uh, the higher the score, the more conflict patients are experimenting. So we can see that um, we were able to show uh, a decrease in decisional conflicts for uh, our patients uh, using the decision aid with their clinicians across um, most of the subscales with the exception of, of support. And yet, one thing to keep in mind, we're still below that threshold of 37.5, which uh, stratify them between low and high conflict. So all low conflict, yet yeah, um, we managed to harm them. Same thing with knowledge. We showed uh, an improvement in knowledge from our participant in our decision aid arm um, for, the, um, for the trial. And we have really few um, missing. I didn't address that at the beginning. But we had uh, less than 15% of missing data across, and um, those were actually collected at the beginning when we struggled a little bit to understand the flow of the patients and where we could catch them afterward to uh, get them to survey, um, to complete our surveys. Um, but that we, um, we addressed this issue later on, and the actual missing rate uh, afterward is, is very minimal. Um, so as for satisfaction, um, same thing. Our uh, patients in the uh, decision aid arm uh, found that um, it was very helpful and that that was just the right amount of information um, they needed. Um, and uh, they would uh, most likely like to receive this information in the same way for other conditions as well and would recommend it to, um, to others uh, as well. And this were um, mostly significant for all of our um, questions. And then we went on to do our videographic analysis. One of the things I did not mention was that we video record all of these encounters. Um, and one of two of the things that we do with those video recording is look at um, the, the level of engagements that clinicians um, have to work with their patients and then the fidelity for which they use their tool. Um, so uh, we had uh, option scores of 46.6% uh, 46 for our decision aid arm compared to 32.5 uh, in our usual care arms, which is still quite high. The average uh, across the spectrum of option score um, 
is 24% as reported in a recent systematic review. So both group um, had relatively high level of, of engagement, um, still significant for our decision in ARM. And similarly for our fidelity of intended use, uh, here I have the raw scar in, in 3.8, but um, it's roughly above above 60% of fidelity of use for our decision in ARM. And again, if you remember, we give them very minimal training, and um, yet they've managed to use it 60% um, of the time the way uh, we would have liked them to. Um, what was interesting with those videographic analysis is that um, they were for the decision in arm, and remember we are um, we are asking them to use it as they think it feels. So we actually only have 44 encounters out of the 57 that have video uh, recording that actually use the cards. Um, and from what we're seeing from these encounters is that our clinicians that were in the decision aid arms actually stated to the patients that they had more than one option. Perfect. Um, similarly, um, you can see the difference between um, the reported health consideration and interaction. So more clinicians talk to their patients about um, and possible interaction from their medicine or any other health con conditions that they should um, that they should be aware of compared to only 8% in our control group. And then if you think about choosing an issue that mattered the most to patients, we had 63% of clinicians addressing that with our patient, whereas no one in our usual care arm talked to patients about what mattered to them. And then um, if we're thinking, again, we really want our tool to be tools that uh, both clinicians and patients can use and that it meets both of their needs. So we want clinicians to be able to voice their preference as well as the patients. And we're seeing that in those in, in our videos that 95% of our clinicians did voice a preference for the decision in arm and 92 in our usual control group. But when you look at the patients voicing their preferences and what they would like in terms of treatment, we see 92% compared to 69% in our um, usual care arms. So um, in conclusion, um, these are uh, fresh out of the box uh, results, so um, we're really excited about them. Uh, but again, it, those are the post-encounters uh, results. So we look forward to um, seeing what the long-term uh, impact is on medication adherence and, um, and mood outcomes. So there is, as always, a couple of limitations to to doing those type of trials, um, but hopefully we'll, uh, the results speak for themselves and we've managed to uh, overcome most of them. Um, so I think that this shows that it is feasible, and, and I'm talking in terms of your, in terms of all three trials, is that it is feasible to successfully translate comparative effectiveness research in a way that um, is brought at the point of care and impact patient important outcome uh, for both our trial and our trials and. and my colleagues. So I'm open to a few questions if you need. And if you want more information, we have a little uh, exhibit at the top if you want to see the tools or if you want to take a copy home as well. We have a couple to give away. Thank you.